So in our first um, uh, lecture together, we were looking at lessons that we could learn from the early church as set out in Acts. And uh, if we notice that this church that's characterized by oneness and by unity, one accord, those were the portions that we noticed over and over and over, this expression of being of one accord. We find that there is liberty of the Spirit of God to work in the midst of these believers. We read over and over that they were filled with the Spirit. If you notice, we read that they were all filled with the Spirit. We've seen instances of the guidance of the Spirit of God. And we see the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God among these believers. Sometimes we ask ourselves today, why is it that we are, uh, there is this weakness and, you know, um, um, there's a failure and weakness amongst us. We, we, we don't seem to have power and, and we don't seem to have strength. And um, I want us to notice some things that characterize this group. And I want us to go through quickly and notice seven great things in Acts that characterize uh, this group of believers. We sometimes say why there is no great things amongst us. Well, maybe it's because there's all this disunity and this harmony and all this infighting. And there is not the oneness and the unity of heart and of soul that should characterize us. Now, the first thing I want us to notice is in Acts 4. And verse 31. It says we, um, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So we find that there is great power demonstrated. And the multitude of those that believe were of one heart and of one soul. Neither did any of them, uh, neither said any of them, that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all. So we have in verse 31, I mean, verse 33, great power. The Spirit of God was unrestrained, so to speak. And we have the place where they were shaken, evidence of the power of God, the presence of God in their midst. Their ones, we need to be as it were in the good of that, to enter a little bit and to know what it is to have the presence of God in our midst. The Lord Jesus said, where two or three are gathered to my name, there am I in the midst of them. To lose sight of the presence of the Lord Jesus to have our eyes on each other, worse yet, to have our eyes on ourselves, is what saps, as it were, this very strength and power that we're talking about. 
It is not that the Lord is not in our midst. But sometimes all this squabbling and all the disunity, uh, we don't see the evidence of the power as we have here. When these disciples, when they pray together, the place shook. We have great power and also in verse 33, great grace was upon them all. What a wonderful result of this when we read in verse 32, this multitude of them that believe, one heart, one soul, what they said, what they did, how the Spirit of God governed their actions, we find that there is great power. And then we also have in verse uh, 8 of this same chapter, chapter 4, verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made well, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man here stand before you whole. This is the stone which you set at naught, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. In verse 29, And now behold, Lord, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servant that they with all boldness may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child. And then we read again how and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they Take the word with boldness. And so we find again evidence of the working of the Spirit of God in the midst. There was great power. There is great boldness. In chapter 2, we have great miracles that are being done couple of passages quickly in chapter 2 verse 43 <coughs> fear came upon every soul many wonders and signs were done by the apostles in chapter 4 verse 16 what shall be done to these men they asked for indeed a notable miracle had been done. Chapter 5, verse 12. 
by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And we had that expression again, they were in one accord in Solomon's colonnade. And uh, in so much, verse 15, they brought the sick, uh, brought forth the sick into the streets, lay them in beds and couches and so on, that least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk. Uh, and on them who were vexed with unclean spirit, and they were all healed. And then in chapter 6, The word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. A great company of priests were obedient unto the faith. And Stephen, full of faith, power, did great wonders and miracles amongst the people. Here is a group united in heart, knit in heart and in soul. Common cause. One center, one object. How there is power demonstrated. Great wonders. Great power. Great boldness. Great miracles. In Acts chapter 2 again, verse 41. We sometimes say we live in a day of small things and sometimes we're satisfied with uh, the weakness and the failure. And, you know, there's no power. But here is a group, no results. You know, we sometimes wonder things are getting, you know, weak and Dying, so to speak, and little interest. Why is it? Here is a group where there is great results. Chapter 2, verse 41. They that gladly received the word were baptized. The same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, they were praising God, having favor with all the people. The Lord added unto the church, unto them, such as should be saved. Chapter 4, verse 4, many of them who heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. We sometimes question why there is no growth, little or no results. Here is a group. The power of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, is at liberty, unrestrained, unhindered. The actions and the things that they did didn't grieve or quench the Spirit in any way. The Spirit had liberty to work amongst them. There is results. Great results. Chapter 4, verse 32. Again. And the multitudes of those that believe. They were of one heart, one soul. Here is multitudes. Chapter 5. We had that before us already. Verse 14. A multitude. And the believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and and of women. You talk about results. We talk about um, uh, 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 failure and, and shortcoming. And here there's results. The scripture used over and over. This is Acts. We were looking at these believers. We said we would uh, look at this little 
company of believers and, and learn some lessons from them. There's great results, great wonder, great grace, great boldness, great miracles. Chapter 2, verse 7. They were all amazed, marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are they not all they that speak Galilean? The people marveled. Verse 12, they were all amazed or perplexed, saying one to another, What? Mean it this. Chapter 3. The layman. Certainly, man came from, a certain man lame from his birth was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an arm. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. Took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was he who sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with great wonder and amazement, that which was happened to him. And the layman who was healed held Peter and John. All the people ran together into the porch. This is Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. There once, here's an opportunity. We have Peter again, able to bring the message of the gospel to the multitude. And so, a uh, great wonder and great amazement. Greatly wondering. And then lastly, there was great fear. We had that in chapter 5. Verse 11, great fear came upon all the church and as many as heard these things. You know, and sometimes I wonder that this fear is lacking amongst us as the people of God. The presence of the Lord and what that means, what that entails, that we are in the Lord's presence, that as an assembly, that what is done is for His glory, that when we meet, that the Lord says, I will be in the midst. The Lord is in the midst. And sometimes, I'm not talking with those on the outside, but even those of us on the inside, we act as if we have no appreciation of the presence of the one, the one in whose presence we are. I'd watch my actions. I'd watch my words. I'd watch my behavior. 
when I recognize the one in whose presence I am. So there are great things that are associated with this church in Acts. Great wonder, great works, great miracles were done. But there was great power and there's great fear. The outside, those looking in, they can see evidences of the presence of God in the midst of those people. So we said we wanted to take a little bit of time also to look at the efforts of the enemy. The enemy would not want to have anything that speak to the glory of the Lord Jesus. A company of believers demonstrating oneness and unity, that which is wrought by the Spirit of God. Men from different backgrounds and different, you know, uh, um, walks of life. And the Spirit of God would bring them together. We read of what happened at Pentecost. And the church, this one body, and that's, I think, is the topic for our next lecture, is it not? The one body. But here is a company that displays the features of Christ and is here for the glory of God. And you think the enemy would leave them alone? You think the enemy would want to have unity and harmony in, in this people? And so what he does, there is attack. And so first of all, we read of the threatenings and there is attack from without. We read, first of all, in Acts chapter 4, that they would threaten them and harass them. And so in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, uh, when they spoke unto the people, the priests, captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them, being grieved that they th taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They arrested them. They put them in prison. There's going to be persecution. In verse 18, do not speak, do not teach in this name. Verse 21, they threatened them. Uh, verse 40, sorry, verse 29, we have their threatenings when the apostles would pray. And so there is persecution in chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, were filled with indignation. They arrested them, laid hands on the apostles, put them in the common prison. They treated them as if they were common criminals. All because of the word of the Lord Jesus. Verse 27. Now the last time they let them go because they found nothing. But here and when they brought them, set them before the council, the high priest asked them, Did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. When Peter and the other apostles answered and said, 
we ought to obey God rather than man. And then we have here how Peter would speak. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Him that God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so it is also, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God had given them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So now they were scheming on how they're going to destroy them. They will kill them. Persecution from without. Verse 40. Now we read of Gamaliel who stood up and he spoke in the council. And so in verse 40, it says, um, To him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them. See, the first time they let them go. Now they whipped them. They had beaten them. They're scheming how they're going to kill them. And they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. And so the enemy is going to bring in uh, uh, threatenings and persecutions. Then in chapter 6, verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom of the spirit which spoke. And this is in the case of Stephen. Then they um, suborned men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, came upon him, caught him, brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses. And uh, this man sees not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And then in this. Uh, chapter 7 verse 54 when they heard these things that is after Stephen had spoken they were cut to the heart and gnashed upon him with their teeth and they were and he being full of the Holy Spirit looked up steadfastly into heaven saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Now here's another accord. But the enemy, he's going to amass, you know, his forces. And in one accord too, against him. There's another place where they did that, I think in the case of uh, the Apostle Paul. But with one accord, they, uh, they ran upon him, cast him out of the city, stoned him. The enemy is attacking from without. He does not want to see a people going along in harmony, in unity, singing and praising God, having favor with God and with men. He does not want to see this. And so he brings in attacks 
and persecution from without. But this does not stop the disciples. And so the enemy also attacks from within. And I want us to notice quickly uh, two incidents of how the enemy would seek to disrupt this harmony and this one accord that we see in the first church. These seven lessons of unity that we would learn from the first church, they, they, these early believers, uh, how the enemy would seek to disrupt that unity. And so in Acts chapter 5, now in chapter 4, and verse 32, we had this before us, but there's a name that uh, the Spirit of God highlights. And I want us to touch on that quickly. In verse 32 of chapter 4, the multitude of those that believe were of one accord, one soul, neither any of them that had anything which he, any, sorry, neither said any of them that anything that he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as, had, as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. What a self sacrificing act. Had lands, sold it, brought it to the apostles' feet. What a wonderful demonstration of these things we're talking about. Being spirit-led, not seeking his own as it were, but the interests, the good of others, and he would bring it and lay it at the apostles' feet. And the Spirit of God makes a record. This man, Barnabas, what a wonderful, what a wonderful commendation, as it were. Chapter 5. A certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And kept back part of the price, his wife also knowing of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then we had the story before. Outwardly, it seems as if it's the same thing. But here the enemy would come in. Here the enemy would, there's this false pretension. Now we had Barnabas and what he did. And how, you know, in the eyes of the saints. What an unselfish act. Now this enemy would come in. Because Peter said to Ananias in his heart that Satan moved him. He came in and he selfishness is now going to have a place. And that's what the enemy would try to do. Introduce this selfishness, self-interest. And as it were to try to, to reproduce falsely that which only the Spirit of God. Peter said, you lie to the Spirit. What a thing. This is what is called hypocrisy. 
He was trying to make it appear as if he also sold his land. He also brought all of it and laid it to the apostles' feet. Because Peter said, while it remained, it was thine own. And even when you sold it. But he comes in on the false pretense. Sometimes there are ones I think there is a lesson to for us. We try to show as if we're more spiritual. We try to show as if we are uh, uh, acting on a higher level. Prompted by the Spirit of God. Professing as it were. Greater spirituality that, you know, um, it's only a front. It's only a face. There is no reality. He did not recognize in whose presence he was. He did not recognize the one with whom he had to deal. There once, if we recognize the one in whose presence we are, the one with whom we are dealing, sometimes we try to make a show for the brethren. And this man and a knife, I think that's what he was trying to do. You know, others would have written his name too. And Ananias also sold what he had. No. The Spirit of God inter intervened. Humanly speaking, when I look at what he did, I would have added, and Ananias also sold what he had and laid it at the apostles' feet. No. There was deception. And God would not allow in the infancy of the, the church, as it were, this group that was there, where we see oneness demonstrated in the verses before, when you read this lovely picture of unity and caring and, and oneness and harmony. And then the Spirit of God would tell us that the enemy under God. Outwardly speaking, it looks okay. But there was deception. And so we find that the enemy would seek to bring in that which would speak of selfishness. Self-interest. And so it's met, it's evil, this sin, it's judge. His wife, we read, she also was party to it. And she also um, was dealt with. So Barnabas showed self-sacrificing love and care for the assembly. He had a good apprehension of spiritual things. He laid hold, as it were, on his true portion, heavenly, and therefore he was willing to give up natural things. Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted the honor without making the sacrifice. They wanted the honor without it costing them, as it were. Make a show of spirituality. Vain glory, covetousness. They try to imitate the fruits of the Spirit in the energy of the flesh.
The enemy would attack. And this was his first attack, as it were, from inside. I want us to quickly look at another. And um, I don't want to go over time again. <laughs> but I want us to quickly look at another in chapter 6. <clears throat> Here we have this company going along happily in fellowship, caring for one another, taking care of the needs. We read that no one had lack. Chapter 4, we had that verse before us earlier. Verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Chapter 6. In those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called a multitude of disciples into, unto them and said, It is not fitting that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look among you for seven men, honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. And then we read of the rest of the matter. But here again, you might say in this assembly where all the needs were being met and no one had lack, how is it that there is murmuring, finding fault? In the midst, there was some, you know, our widows are not being taken care of. We're not getting our fair share. It's the enemy coming in again. In the midst of this oneness and unity, a unity of heart and soul we've been talking about. This assembly that we've been learning lessons from, lessons in unity. Murmuring. Somebody starts to find fault, grumble. There are ones, the enemy, you know, his tactics doesn't change. You know, if we look among ourselves, sometimes we, we can hear the murmuring. Somebody points something out. You know, oftentimes, you never thought about it until somebody pointed out. Did you know that brother so-and-so? Did you hear that? Did you, they did this. Murmuring. It is the same spirit. It undermines this unity and harmony that we've been talking about. Does it not? It undermines that oneness. Let's listen to ourselves. Let's hear what comes out of our mouth. You know, the Spirit of God, He changes our language. If you notice, we read when the Spirit came upon them, they were filled. They spoke of the wonders of God. The wonderful works of God. Filled with the Spirit. Twice over we read in the book of Acts. Where they spoke of the wonders of the works of God. And the wonder of the word of God. But here amongst their very midst. There is another sound. Murmuring. Pointing finger. Our widows are not being taken care of. The enemy is going to attack. And we have to be careful. Very subtle sometimes. Sometimes not very obvious, as in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Outwardly speaking, humanly on the outside, it looked okay. You know, the apostles dealt with this. And I think there's also a lesson for us, and we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. 
But it's very touching how the apostles dealt with this problem. These were Grecian Jews. Because remember here, the early church, they were all Jews. They were not the Greeks yet brought in. I mean the Gentiles yet. These were Grecian Jews. And they were more, there was this question about their widows not being taken care of like the others. The apostle says to them, you choose seven men. If you go through the list, you would find that all the names are Greek. Those who were chosen were, as it were, of that same company. You have a problem, so to speak? Okay, we let you administer it all. Some of us would say, you know, we should have a 50-50. At least we should have some of the Hebrew um, representatives there too. No, they give it all. You administer. You run it. There was, if we have that spirit, we're going to have less problems in the assembly. You have a problem with it? Okay. Then you administer. It wasn't done in passion. It wasn't done in haste. If you notice, these apostles, they lay their hands upon them. We read there was prayer. They lay their hands upon them. It shows identity. They identified with what was going on. It says in uh, verse 5, they're saying, please the whole multitude. And the verse, they chose these in verse 5 and verse 6, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, laid their hands upon them. And the word of God increased. And the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. What an example. Meeting this matter. They didn't let it fester. They didn't blow it off as not important. They met it dealt with it and they could go on again in peace and in harmony the enemy is going to attack and in our little outline I'm looking at uh, it says that we are to address Satan's ways and efforts to dissolve this unity we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. And yet he creeps in over and over. And he attacks the unity. He attacks the oneness. <clears throat> Truly, if we are filled with the Spirit, then our speech, as I mentioned, will be effective. And we have one more unity we want to talk about, and it's unity of speech. In Romans chapter 15,
Verse 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmity of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen on me. For whatever things were written in earlier times were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant that you be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. That ye may with one mind, one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We started off by saying, what's our purpose for being here? And as an assembly, you know, here at the assembly in Bethesda, you might say, what's the purpose? What's the main reason for this assembly to be here? For those of us involved, what's the reason? What's our purpose? I want to suggest that above and beyond all, it should be for the glory of God. Now we had this, these lessons from the assembly in Acts. And we see how the Spirit of God is unhindered when uh, uh, there is unity and there is harmony. Because at the beginning we asked the question, can the Spirit of God really do great things for the glory of God? Where there is, you know, this unity and where there is strife and there is all this, um, this harmony. And the answer, of course, we know. But here we have that the Spirit is unhindered. And uh, it affects our actions. It affects our thinking, our mindset, our thoughts. We had the expression like-minded. It affects our speech. Here before us we have unity in praise and in worship. For the glory of God, that God might be glorified. Our blessed Lord Jesus, when he walked this wilderness saying, I have glorified thee on the earth, he says. He has glorified God in everything, every step he took. He is our example. And that's what we have here in Romans 15. Uh, verse 3. For even Christ. The apostle brings before us our blessed Lord Jesus. He pleased not himself. We read in verse 3. Selfishness. Set aside. That's what we have in the case of Ananias and Sapphira in the judging of that iniquity. Selfishness set aside. Here in Romans we have a united people. That the Apostle Paul, the Apostle prays, he says that ye may with one mind, one mouth. Verse uh, 6. Glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One people united, 
one purpose that God might be glorified. That they might be here for the glory of God. We have in Psalms, we have in Psalms 133, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God is glorified by what we do there once, how we act. And then we have in Psalm 34, and I'll finish on this. I got a signal. Psalm 34. We could read that portion together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Dear ones, what's our purpose, our ultimate reason for being here? Where the Lord has placed us in the assembly. What's my purpose for being here? Why is it the Lord has put me in this assembly at this time? My own thoughts, my own feelings, what I feel, what I think, my opinion. Is that what governs what happens amongst the people of God? Or is it the glory of God? And what brings praise for blessed Lord Jesus. Oh that God would grant. That we might. This new year. We started off saying. We are the brink of a new year. That we might recognize. Lord help me to live. Today. For your glory. Help that what I say. And do in the assembly might be for the glory of the one who has given so much for me. Oh, that we might learn a lesson or two from this early church in the book of Acts. I think there is much that we can learn from them. God grant that it might be so for his name's sake.